Hello everyone, Eric Marks here again with FindingMiddleEarth.com. Uh, still here enjoying my birthday weekend in the awesome Opryland Resort. And I thought I'd take another uh, chance here to do another tutorial for you. This time it's going to be on stitching panoramas together and more importantly how to set up the panorama in camera. There's a lot of softwares that will actually do the panoramas for you, but uh, people's biggest questions is how to actually go about getting the photos to stitch in the first place. So. Uh, number one with a panorama is making sure your virtual horizon is level. So if your camera does not have a horizon built in, uh, most smartphone apps like Android and iPhone actually can get a free leveling app. And so what I do is I'll just take my iPhone if I don't have a level and I'll put it on the front of my lens and I'll let my iPhone or my Android app just kind of level out my camera for me. So you can get it close enough is my point. You don't want the horizon kind of wonky going off left or right. So get it close enough if you don't have one built in because that's number one to stitching it together after you take them is make sure everything is as level as possible. Um, after level, the biggest thing is uh, you want to take your panoramas in vertical on your camera instead of landscape mode. The reason being is because if you're in vertical, you're capturing a wide aspect ratio from top to bottom so that when it comes time to make the panorama, you can crop it down to make this very nice wide uh, horizontal. Whereas if you're shooting in your camera in horizontal, you're already kind of cropped uh, like a four by three ratio horizontally. So then your panorama is going to be really small and slender. So I always shoot my panoramas vertically so that I have a lot of cropping room later. Um, other than that, let's go ahead and talk about the settings. So I'm in manual mode on my camera. Uh, I know a lot of times I shoot an aperture priority, but uh, when you're stitching the panoramas together, you want to make sure that your exposures are the same, more or less, all the way through. So that way it's not giving you, you know, a uh, 60th of a second exposure over here and then a 200th of a second exposure over here. You want them to be about the same settings so that, again, when stitching after you've taken the photos, you make it as easy on the software as possible so that the lighting is roughly the same, the aperture is the same, the focus is about the same. So if you're going to keep your center focus point in the center, keep it in the center all the way across. Okay, so let's go and get started. So what I've done here is I have already decided what I want the center point of my panorama to be. Um, typically very, uh, you know, very uh, level and even lines work good in panoramas. So uh, I'm shooting dead center down a walkway here in this hotel. And then to my left and right, I have some cool stores and shops and lights. So I pick my focal point right here in the center. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from left to right. You can go either way. You can go right to left or left to right. Um, but I'm going to start left. And I'm basically going to make sure that my first photo is going to be where I want kind of roughly the end of my picture to be, right? When I'm Because I'm kind of envisioning this in my head. And so when I start there, the biggest thing is when you're sweeping your photos across, make sure that you overlap each photo by about a third. So if you don't understand that, let me kind of give you an example, okay? Let's say that I'm starting to the left. If I'm shooting this is my left picture, you want to make sure your next photo is going to be overlapping that first photo by about a third. The reason why you're doing that is, is because when the software starts stitching these photos together, it wants to see similarities between all the photos. So if there's a tree or a, uh, you know, a building or, or even like an edge of a building, it, it actually detects the textures or the contrast or the colors in each photo. And if you overlap them, it makes it super quick and easy to stitch them together because it does it automatically. You don't really stitch them manually. So I'm going to go ahead and do just that. I'm going to put it into practice. Everything's in manual mode. Right now, my meter is giving me, let's see, uh, about uh, one and a half seconds at F8, okay? Um, and so we're going to go ahead and start with the left here and sweep around to the right. It'll probably be about, I don't know, four or five pictures altogether, maybe, maybe even six. Uh, it can be as many as you want. Just make sure it, it's kind of a left and right sweep. So I'm going to go ahead and start that now, and then afterwards we'll jump into Photoshop and I'll show you how I stitch them. So let's take the first one here. I'm going to line everything up. I'm using my center focus point. It doesn't matter so much with a wide angle lens which focus point you're using because everything is pretty much going to be in focus. Uh, but your center focus point's your strongest. So I'm going to go ahead and take my center focus point, take my first shot. All right, got that wrapped up. And I'm going to overlap the next one by a third, remember. So I'm going to take my next one and leave about a third of the last photo in the frame. Got that one in the bag. I'm going to do the same thing all the way through, line it up dead center. There's my center focal point going down to the center of the little walkway there. And I'm going to overlap that center point by about a third for the next one. And I might actually have to change my focus point on this one so that it gives me focus. There we go. Good. 
Um, and then the next one overlaps. So right now I think we're on photo number four, I believe, if my math is correct. Then I'm gonna go ahead and sweep one more to number five, just in case I need the extra room when I'm post-processing. And it's as easy as that. Other than that, just check sharpness, you know, check your histogram, make sure that your meter is correct and you're not over or under exposing. Uh, other than that, obviously, let's just kind of recap real quick. So tripod, uh, level your horizons out, overlap each photo by about a third on each one so that the software has something similar between the photos to stitch. And uh, most important, just have fun. Photography and art is just about getting out there and kind of getting your creative juices flowing. And uh, I'm just here to help you guys create uh, new ways to have fun and get creative. So thank you guys for watching as always, and I will see you in the next one. All right, welcome back everyone. So I'm back home now in my office. I uh, just got back from Nashville uh, yesterday, and uh, it was just a super fun trip. So thank you guys all so much for all of my birthday emails and comments and messages. Uh, it was great. Um, it, the Opryland Hotel is like the perfect place to go if you just want like a peaceful getaway. Uh, I like to be, you know, super just chilled out and have a nice like zen vacation, and that is the place to go if you want to do that. Uh, we spent most of the time just walking around the hotel, uh, looking at the waterfalls and sitting by the fountains, and it was just wonderful. It was a nice like stress reliever and just a, it's a nice just to get away. So, um, all right, so I've already taken my panorama shots uh, that you saw me sweep around from left to right. And so now let's look into uh, how we're gonna stitch them together here. So there is something I wanna note before we get into this. Um, there are about a million ways to uh, get panorama shots stitched together uh, in Photoshop, so, or even in other software. So don't think that you know, whatever way I'm gonna do it is like the way. Uh, every way does it, everybody does it differently. Um, even I've done it different than this before. Sometimes I use Photoshop, sometimes I use a software called AutoPano. It just kind of depends on the situation, really, uh, because sometimes Photoshop doesn't do the best job at stitching certain kinds of uh, panoramas. Uh, but for panoramas like this, where everything is very symmetrical and the lines are very, very evident uh, in the photos, Photoshop should do just fine. Um, so let's go ahead and jump in, and I will show you how I'm going to stitch this together from start to finish. All right, so here we are inside of Lightroom CC. Uh, as you can see, I've already five-starred all of the photos here. There are uh, one, two, three, four, five photos all together uh, in the panorama here. And before I take them into Photoshop and actually stitch them together, I am going to do a little bit of uh, globalized post-processing on them, just a very little bit uh, to bring out the best of each photo before I send them through Photoshop. So uh, I was underexposing these a good bit to try to retain some detail in the highlights. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is just kind of raise the exposure a little bit. Maybe about half a stop. Good. And I'm going to take down the highlights a tad and then raise the shadows a good bit. Hmm, maybe about 75 or so. Uh, and then raise the blacks here. And you can see on my histogram that at the beginning of this shot, uh, most of everything was kind of leaning way towards the left here in the shadows and there's not a whole lot that I captured in the highlights but there's just enough as you can see on this very bottom line uh, to where I do have some detail in the highlights but I did not blow them out so I'm still gonna move this black slider a little ways to kind of even out uh, the dynamic range a little bit and I'm gonna add just a tad bit of contrast because whenever you bring out shadows and uh, bring up your blacks, it flattens the image quite a bit. So I'm um, done with all that. And we're gonna come down here and remove the chromatic aberrations and enable profile corrections on the lens. Um, as far as sharpening, Lightroom doesn't do the best job at output sharpening. Uh, most of the time I just go to zero, but if you want to, you can leave it at 25. That's the default. But I'm just gonna go to zero for this because uh, I have a, a couple of special ways to sharpen in Photoshop. So now that we're done with that, uh, as you can see, that was just like literally very, very basic and very easy stuff. Um, let's go ahead and just shift select the rest of these photos here, and we'll sync all of those settings across. So synchronize. There you go. So now all of the other photos have the exact same uh, post-processing that I did on the first one, so that way they're all evenly distributed across all five photos, because I took um, each photo, remember, in manual mode on the exact same settings in the camera. So that way, 
uh, more or less the settings will affect each photo about the same. So now that I've selected all five, let's go ahead and right click the first photo and I'm going to do edit in and go down here and do merge to panorama in Photoshop. So go ahead and let that work for a second. Um, so like I said, there's a million different ways you can merge these things in uh, Photoshop or Lightroom even has something, but I will tell you that um, a lot of the time and the loading times and the processing will depend on the speed of your computer. So just be aware of that. Um, these are, keep in mind that these are five 36 megapixel photos that Photoshop is having to stitch together. So it's, it's a lot of information, a lot of data um, that Photoshop is having to kind of compile in its algorithm and spit out this beautiful panorama. So keep that in mind. Uh, that if it takes a long time for you, it might be because your computer's a little slower, um, but you know, it's fine, it will happen eventually. So uh, now it, it brought up this dialogue screen here, um, and most of the time I always just leave it on auto to stitch them together, but if auto doesn't work so good, then I'll move down here to cylindrical, uh, and if auto or cylindrical doesn't work, then you can try doing it in Lightroom or another uh, piece of software like Autopano, but I've never had uh, one of these just completely not work on me. So I'm gonna just leave it on auto. For, oh wait, before I hit okay, we're gonna do uh, blend image together, yes, and I'm gonna check the geometric distortion correction and then hit okay. <clears throat> and if you don't know what the geometric distortion correction is, uh, head over to uh, my videos on my YouTube channel and watch my focus stacking tutorial where I go uh, pretty in-depth on what the geometric distortion tool actually does and how it affects the photos. So as you can see here, it's uh, Photoshop is just doing its best to align all these photos for me. And like I said, there's five 36 megapixel photos. So it's, it's just, you know, it's an, it's an insane amount of information to put together. And I can only imagine how many megapixels the final result will be. Um, after I crop it, I'm probably going to end up with like a 60 or 70 megapixel photo, which that's what's so cool about panoramas to me is that I can print them at pretty much whatever size I want. I mean, the Nikon D810 already gives you 36 megapixels, but I love being able to print at literally whatever size I want. Uh, it's, it's very nice to have that in case you want to do, you know, some kind of specialty print on your fine art gallery and offer a panorama at like an insane size that, you know, most other photographers may not be able to do. So just bear with me here as Photoshop keeps chugging along here, mixing everything together. <clears throat> I wanted to do this in, uh, in real time so that you can just see everything. I know a lot of other photographers kind of skip certain steps and cut out certain parts of the video, but I just, like I said, just want to do all this in real time so, it's, so that it's literally like you're right here kind of looking over my shoulder. And I don't know if any of you guys have ever been to this place, but I just can't, can't say enough good things about it. This hotel is just so crazy. It makes you feel like you're in the Amazon or something. There's trees and plants all throughout the place. It's beautiful. All right, so we're almost done here. It says uh, blend selected layers based on content, which means it's about to, to create layer masks through all five of these layers here, which are all the photos we're stitching together. That's one of the cool parts about uh, Photoshop stitching them is that you can actually see uh, through layer masks exactly what it blended together and where it stitched. Beautiful. So check that out. So over here to the right in the layers, this is what I was talking about. You can see that Photoshop created a layer mask for each photo and you can see what part of the photo that it used and actually blended together. It's pretty, pretty cool that it does that. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and flatten these images down into one, which is Command E. And then I'm going to crop. So I'm going to hit the C key and we'll just crop away here. So we'll crop to there and maybe we'll crop to, let's see, we'll crop to there, bring in on the sides and oh, let me undo that. And so, you know, I could be a lot more precise with this because I'm, I'm a very, uh, I'm a perfectionist when it comes to being symmetrical, but just for the sake of this video, I'm not going to bore you to death with all the crazy details. Okay, so we're good with that. Um, so there is our panorama uh, actually stitched, and you can see it did a very good job. If you zoom in, which of course is going to be insanely detailed, I mean, just look, it didn't, 
It didn't mix up any details. It didn't mix up any lines. Everything, all the lines, the atrium up here is perfectly put together. Because um, I, I don't know if you guys have ever done panoramas on like your smartphone or something, but typically something will go wrong where you can actually tell it was stitched together and it wasn't stitched together very good. Now, granted, it's a smartphone and it does a very good job, but uh, as you can see, Photoshop's algorithm is actually beautiful. I mean, you could you could sell these as prints and they're just, they're perfect. So, uh, you know, we could do a lot more work here. There's a lot of people in the shot. There's a person here walking here. There's some motion blur down here. Uh, arguably, a lot of photographers would like to remove these. I kind of like them. I think it adds a bit of life and a bit of interest into the shot. Um, I love them in the shot, actually. It just adds that bit of, you know, just like I said, life. It just adds some good interest there. So, okay. So what we're going to do now uh, is just some final touches. Cause, because I said I'm not just going to stitch them. I'm going to just kind of post-process this thing for you. I'm not going to spend time on every single little detail, but we'll go ahead and uh, work on a few. So the first thing I'm going to do is just duplicate the layer. And I'm going to go and let's see. I'm going to go to my filters here. Where are my filters? And let's go to, doo -doo -doo, what do I want to use? Hmm, let's see. I, there's so many filters that it's just kind of tough uh, to know which ones you want to use. Let's start with blur. I'm going to do a Gaussian blur here. I'm going to blur this one maybe f closer to 40 or 45. There we go, 45 pixels. And then I'm going to do this. So this might seem a little weird. By the way, I, I can tell there's a little... Uh, problem with cropping there. I'll fix that later. Um, what I'm going to do is actually hit shift command A and open camera raw. Okay. And the reason I'm doing this is because I know I'm about to blend this blurry layer with the sharp layer. But first I'm going to crank my exposure up probably about a stop and a half. Uh, because when you blend these two images together with a blur layer, it makes the overall result extremely dark. So I'm going to go ahead and take this blurry layer on top and change the blending mode from normal to, uh, where is it at? Multiply. There it is. All right. Now look at that. That just gave it this kind of dreamy, you know, cool, interesting look. Um, but we can actually back that off a little bit using the opacity. So I'll back that off just a tad. And then what I like to do after that uh, is I like to take the eraser tool. So I'm going to just get my eraser brush here. And... We'll make it maybe, let's see, the opacity about 25% or so. Make the brush a little bigger. I'm just gonna kinda dapple some light back in to certain places. So let's just kinda spill some light back into here, maybe around these little lamp posts here. Make the brush a little smaller. We'll just kinda dapple some light in on these certain bushes. That way we're kinda adding back in our creative lighting uh, without having to actually do a bunch of layer masking and all this other stuff. We're just kind of this whole blurry layer effect that I did really just kind of added this dreamy look. And so now I'm just adding some interesting lighting and dynamics back into the scene here. Let's add some light on this walkway where these people are. I like that. I like that a lot. Isn't this just a happy looking place? I mean, look at, oh, it's just, I love it. It's so cool. Pretty much anywhere you decide to sit and chill out in this place, there's something, it's like an oasis. There's something down here. There's a big river where they do these boat, like a, like jungle cruise boat rides around the hotel. It's just such a happy place. Um, all right. So for now, I think that's good. Maybe let's add, let's add a big streak of light back through here. We've got this atrium coming in, right? So it would be kind of spilling some light onto these rooms. Little happy lights over here. All right, I like that. So now we'll blend these together. Do Command E, and we'll make another duplicate. And let's open it back up in Adobe Camera Raw. So I'm gonna do Shift Command A. And now we'll kind of change the white balance around and add some color back in. So I want to take a second to stop and just say that as I'm doing this. Um, you know, keep in mind, this isn't what you're supposed to do to post-process. It's whatever you want it to do. The post-processing uh, process, if you will, is all creative. It's all up to the artist. That's what really makes us unique as photographers is how we go about doing this. The only reason I film what I do is because I might, you know, open your eyes to a technique that you've never 
seen or never heard of before. And then you'll kind of form your own uh, technique from that, right? So like if I do this blurry layer effect, you might do the same thing, but you might blur it a little more or blur it a little less or add a little less color or more color or less light, more light. So all of this, you know, it's very rare. It's actually almost impossible that I could post-process a photo and then take the photo again and then post-process the photo again and that they would be identical. That's what's so cool about painting and photography is that you're never going to get exactly the same results because tomorrow I might be in kind of a, you know, more... I don't know, dramatic mood where I want some more drama, right? I want some more drama in my lighting. Maybe I, I'll change it to black and white, but tonight I'm kind of, you know, happy and I'm kind of reminiscing on these memories on the weekend. And so I want this, you know, to be bright and happy colors. And so that's what's so cool is just take creative control of your photos and do with it whatever you want. And don't let anybody tell you different because uniqueness is what sells your prints in this day and age of photography. Because this day and age, everyone's a photographer, right? They'll buy, anyone will buy a Canon Rebel and they're all of a sudden a photographer. And I'm not, you know, looking down on people to do that, but what I'm saying is people are looking for that unique type of art. So I just wanted to note that before I start making all these decisions in here because I haven't pre-planned anything. I'm just going to kind of make creative decisions as I go. And if it looks good and, and it looks, you know, pleasing to my eye, then I'm going to go with it. So let's jump back in here to Adobe Camera Raw. And I think there needs to be a little more uh, warmth in this scene because I've been talking about what, you know, how cozy and happy this place is. So let's add a little bit of warmth into it. Let's take some yellows back into it. There we go. Let's add some pinks into it. A little bit of the magentas coming in there. There we go. It's more, some more yellows and golden tones. I like that. A little even more magenta. Good. And then let's go opposite with the clarity. Let's, let's kind of go a little blurry with the clarity and kind of blur these lights out a little bit. Add some more contrast. I like that. There we go. Take down the highlights ever so slightly just again. And then boost the overall exposure again just a bit. Raise the shadows. Very good. All right. And then let's, let's add some color. Some vibrance and a little bit of saturation. There we go. Now that... That scene that I remember is starting to come out. There we go. Let's add a little more magenta still. I'm kind of going crazy with this magenta right now. I kind of like it. It's adding this like very angelic glow to the room. All right, so there's the magenta, the warmth, some contrast, some shadows. So just those little simple things have already made this just a much better photo than it was. Okay, so now let's go over here to effects. I'm gonna add uh, some post-crop vignetting. I think it, this panorama could actually use that because the, the main focus and the main kind of center point is this walkway here. So let's do this. Let's do a kind of a crazy vignette. Um, typically not a big vignette guy, but this I think this photo just kind of is screaming for it. So let's do that. Midpoint in a little more. Yeah, I like that. Because there's even though, you know, everything to the far left and far right is, is interesting and cool, you know, still the main, the main show and the main interest is all right here. And then there's little details, right, all in between. So if someone got a big print of this, then, you know, obviously the first thing their eye would go to is this walkway and then some of these shops and lights. And then they would start noticing the little things, like these people down here. Look at this. Look at this man way off in the distance looking down his balcony. My room, actually, by the way, was over here. I believe that's my room. It was one of these balconies over here, overlooking this huge fountain that's over here behind this building. Um, okay, so anyway, so uh, that is the vignette. I like that. We're still not going to add sharpening yet. I'm going to have, there's another way I want to do that. Um, let's see, what else do I want to do? What else? <laughs> I think that's about good for now. And as far as camera raw goes, let's hit OK. All right, now look at the difference. Look at the before and after from what we started with just before camera raw. So there's that and then that. And that was just, I mean, just a few seconds before we took it into camera raw. That just added that bit of warmth and coziness. This is kind of a cold, dreary day, and then boom. That's how it felt when I was there. I love that. All right, let's go ahead and Command E and merge these down again. And what else I want to do? Let's go ahead and uh, I typically like to add the sharpening last because I don't like to sharpen the pixels and then start bending and manipulating the pixels again. Um, so I would start um, going into all my plugins that I normally use. By the way, I use my most used plugins in Photoshop 
are going to be the On One Suite and the Nick Collection Suite. I love Nick Collection, um, Color Effects Pro, HDR Effects Pro. Color Effects Pro is probably my most used. Color Effects Pro gives beautiful contrast presets, and it also does beautiful color, hence the name Color Effects Pro. Uh, I'm not going to do that for this tutorial, just because for some reason the Nick Collection Suite takes quite a while to load everything, and then it take after you hit OK, it takes another like minute to minute and a half to kind of apply the settings. So I'm just kind of replicating what I would do in that software uh, in Camera Raw. But just so you know, if you want to know. Uh, you know, if I were to spend like an hour on this photo off camera, I would definitely use the Nick Collection Color Effects Pro and uh, some of the On One photography software as well. So look into that. Nick Collection is now free, by the way. Uh, so it's you can definitely hop over to Google site and get that right now. That's got a great suite. I paid hundreds of dollars for it uh, <laughs> like a, like two years ago, uh, but now they made it free and it's a great suite of plugins. So before we, uh, since we're not going to jump into the plugins, let's just go ahead um, and pretend like we're done for now. Because I mean, I'm relatively happy with this. It looks really good. Let's go ahead and add our sharpening. So what we're going to do with that is go to Filter, Other, and then High Pass. Okay. So you can also do. You're probably wondering, Eric, you skipped over the sharpen section. So yes, there's all these sharpen uh, options as well. There's uh, just regular sharpening. There's sharpen edges. Uh, the most common one people use is unsharp mask. I know that sounds kind of counterintuitive because the word unsharp actually sharpens the photo. Uh, so I either use high pass or unsharp mask. But lately, um, with all of Photoshop's updating that they do on the Creative Cloud version, the high pass actually works really well without adding noise. So I'm going to go to the high pass, and it's going to look very weird at first. Uh, you can almost barely just barely make out the details. So what, the, what you do is, I'm just gonna start with maybe like two pixels, and we're gonna see if that brings in any detail. So I don't know if you can see this, but let me zoom in and see if you can see this. I mean, just barely you can see uh, a little bit of the text and kind of the atrium and some of the outlines of the buildings in here. And so that's what you wanna get to. If you start adding too many pixels and you see color, so for example, like this, you start seeing color, that's not going to work. That's gonna make your photo look insane. So you wanna back it off to right around, typically right around one and a half to two pixels is kind of my sweet spot. So I'm going to just go with two. I'm gonna do two pixels and I'm gonna hit okay. And it's going to stay like this until I change the blending mode. So I'm gonna change the blending mode from normal to overlay and voila. So watch this. So let's see if we can zoom in on something here. And I'll show you the difference, okay? So let's zoom in this. Okay, I'm going to turn off the sharpening layer, that high pass filter. And look at that difference. And there it is with it. There's without, and there it is with it. Without, and with it. So you can see, even just back here in the concrete, all the little, uh, you know, pieces of gravel and everything in the concrete just really, I mean, that detail just gets extracted from it. So off, on, off, on. I love it. It's a great way to sharpen. It doesn't add noise anymore. It used to add noise really bad. Uh, but ever since Photoshop has been regularly updating their Creative Cloud, it's a great tool. Uh, and if you're not happy with the result, then go back into the high pass filter and change how many pixels you want to use. You can go, you know, three pixels, four pixels. The kind of general rule with the high pass tool is that the higher megapixel um, your camera is or your photo is, uh, the more pixels you'll have to use in your high pass. So for example, I have a 36 megapixel photo, but this is a panorama. So, it, you know, it's a lot of pixels. I'm not sure exactly how many. Um, so, you know, you, if you have a 50 megapixel camera, for example, and you're going to stitch together five or six images, you might have to use five or six pixels of the high pass filter. Uh, disc ejected properly, not properly. Okay. I don't care. Um, so I think we're about done. Uh, it's, I mean, I like the way it turned out. Uh, the only other thing that I would do, which I'll just show you briefly because I might as well, um, you'll notice that my wide angle lens kind of made some of these lines a little wonky. You can see that's that tower looks like it's about to fall over right there. And then this building is kind of leaning. So I'll just show you kind of like a basic uh, way that I would fix that. I would typically spend a lot of time fixing these lines. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I will show you how basically I would go about doing it. So I would just go up here to edit, transform, and then warp. And a lot of people don't know about this tool, but it is one of the best tools 
in the entire world. So you can see these little anchor points, these little dots here. All of these anchor points are actually points where you can bend the pixels of the image. So let me zoom this in and let me show you what I mean here. So let's just, you can grab anywhere on the photo, okay? And you can grab and pull. And you're actually pulling and bending the pixels back to a straight line. And as you can imagine, and as you can see here, it kind of takes some work to get it perfect but with the right amount of work and patience, you can definitely get it perfect. So that is almost straight up and down. Let me move the base a little bit. We're getting there. Let's move this. Do that. Okay, so there's that. And then let's work on this clock tower a little bit. Let's kind of smush this in. And we'll kind of pull this out. Okay. And we'll kind of take this line and bend it a little bit. We'll take this little center point and shift it down. And we'll take this anchor point here and kind of shift it. There we go. And then we'll take this and shift it. All right. Let's go back here. Pull it down a little bit. Okay, so I mean, that's basic. Obviously, I mean, I spend anywhere from 15 minutes to 45 minutes on with this tool based on, you know, how bad the lines are. So let's go ahead and hit enter, okay? And I'm going to turn off the bottom layer because that's still got the regular photo underneath that has not been uh, warped and transformed. So let me turn that off. And you can see, since I bent the pixels in, there is some... Uh, space here where there's dead pixels and you know we, we're gonna have to crop again so that's fine because keep in mind remember this is a huge megapixel file so we'll bring this in just ever so slightly and we'll bring this down ever so slightly and I think that's we'll bring this in too just to make it to keep everything symmetrical oh what did I do uh, let's hit crop again let's bring this in a little further Maybe something like that, hit enter, and there we go. So I, more or less, I've fixed the line that was leaning in like crazy. Let me show you, let's turn it off. So that's what it was. These two lines here and here were leaning really bad, and then I took it to that. So I just kind of bent everything in to stop the converging lines. Um, anyway, so that about wraps up everything. Um, again, don't, you know, if, if you're gonna play around with that warp tool, uh, make sure that you spend a lot of time and, and make sure you duplicate your layer so that you don't write over the master file. But it's, it, I mean, it can help in many ways instead of just converging lines. You can do a lot of things with it. Uh, but just be careful with it because it can, you know, make your photo look a little weird, either stretched or smushed if you don't use it correctly. So I recommend using it with a Wacom tablet. I pretty much always use this little pen in my tablet and it, I mean, I just get the most natural looking, uh, whenever I'm blending HDRs, I get very natural looking brush strokes. I'm getting very natural looking uh, warping and transforming photos. And so make it look as natural as you can. Um, and then obviously in Lightroom, what I could have done as well, um, which it probably would have helped is, uh, let me show you actually, back in Lightroom, I'll show you what I could have done which would have helped a little bit. Let me go here. Um, right here, let me go back to the, down here where the profile corrections were. So if you go back down here in Lightroom where it says enable profile corrections, the next little box down where it says transform, there is an auto function or a level function. And so if I, if I would have hit auto here, you can see it'll kind of do a self fix and it makes these lines uh, straight and uh, correct but it also crops it. So you, do have, you would have to do this on every single photo and then go ahead and crop your photo before Photoshop stitches it. So you can do that and it would probably have saved me from having to do the transform and warp tool. Uh, but it is an extra step before you stitch. So it's just up to you whether you wanna do the extra step before you stitch or the extra step after. Um, looking back, you know, for the tutorial, this is, I didn't do this because you wouldn't have understood until I jumped all the way into Photoshop and showed you the lines. Um, however, uh, you know, if I were to do this over again and I wasn't being filmed, I probably would just go through the trouble of doing all these before and cropping them and just hitting the auto function here. 
uh, under Transform in Lightroom because Lightroom actually does a really, really great job at uh, auto-fixing and auto-correcting the lens, uh, lens problems whenever the wide-angle lenses kind of converge the lines. So uh, keep that in mind. Lightroom is really good at doing that if you ever have uh, problems with the wide-angle lenses kind of bending in your corners. Um, anyway, so that about wraps up the photo and the panorama. I really hope you guys enjoyed the tutorial. I really enjoyed uh, being on location and shooting everything and making the tutorial for you. So as always, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. I'm always here. Uh, you know I love what I do, so anytime you comment, I will respond. And as always, I will see you guys in the next one. Take care. If you would like to stay up to date on all of my latest photography videos and adventures, click the big subscribe button below. And if you would like to find out more about me and how to become a great photographer, visit my website at findingmiddleearth.com.